Um, you probably won't be too surprised to know what the main topic of Sky Notes is going to be if you've been following the comet that we have in the sky at the moment. But I'm going to start off, as I always do, in the middle of the solar system with the sun. And uh, the sun is remarkably active at the moment. We have a naked eye sunspot. Uh, various people have reported seeing this. Obviously, don't stare at the sun to see the sunspot, but, uh, but use an appropriate filter, or people have actually seen it in, in fog and cloud. But it's definitely a naked eye spot. It's just passed over the central meridian. This, uh, this is the MDI uh, continuum image from yesterday. Yeah, so uh, a big sunspot in the, just passed over the central meridian and a lot of other sunspots too. And uh, Peter Meadows provided me uh, with this. This is the uh, plot of BAA sunspot number um, over the last few years. And you can see that there's definitely been a significant increase uh, at the end of 2022, uh, beginning of 2023. So the sun is definitely worth observing. And we've had lots of really good pictures of it submitted uh, to the BAA. This one from Honor Wheeler. Um, on the 15th of January, so here it is, that sunspot, that big sunspot coming over the limb. The sun's rotating in this direction. You'll see um, this is on the same day by Stuart Green, and what he's got there is some hydrogen alpha images and then images of each of the sunspots. So this is the, the, the big one, the naked eye spot, uh, AR13190, um, but there are lots of other spots too. So if you do get the opportunity to see the sun during the day, and we've had lots of, certainly down in the southeast of England, we've had lots of sunny days recently. Um, just depends on whether you're actually at home and able to use a uh, telescope. But even just taking a, um, something like eclipse glasses, if you have any, or some solar filter material, just have a look at the sun with naked eye, and you should see this big spot. And it's quite an unusual event to have a spot that's visible with the naked eye. Fantastic picture here by Carl Baron showing it very close up, showing the solar granulation around the spot and the very large umbra, which has been quite active and quite persistent over the last few days. Um, so you need to look at it in the next week or so because it will rotate off the other limb if you leave it too long. Uh, Moving forward to the 18th, so just three days ago, two days ago, this is James Whiteman's image of it in um, white light and hydrogen alpha. And the sun, because the sun's getting more and more active now, it's worth looking at every day just to see what's coming over the limb. Uh, we still have visual observers. Peter Meadows uh, tries to make a drawing of the sun every day that he can by projection. <clears throat> and uh, here is this drawing from the 19th when that big spot was right on the central meridian. So it's moved on a little bit now, um, but uh, the sun is still very active and we've had quite a lot of flares and I really like this. This is a, an animation of a flare uh, by Mattia Piccoli um, showing really impressive activity. And of course the sun has been uh, active and, and the solar wind has been very turbulent and we'll see the effect that that has on, on the comet uh, in a little while. But uh, the solar wind that's coming out from the sun and the, uh, the coronal mass ejections that come out from the sun flow out through the solar system and affect lots of things. They, they affect our ionosphere, they lead to auroral displays, but they also affect the tails of comets. Um, a couple of things related to the sun, which I, I really enjoyed seeing on the website, are pictures taken with this. Now, this just looks like a, a can that you might get a fizzy drink or a soft drink in, but it's a solar can. And you can make these yourself, but you can also buy them. They're not that expensive. And what they are is a pinhole camera uh, containing some photographic paper. So the photographic paper is very insensitive. It's a pinhole camera, so the whole camera is pretty insensitive, but the idea is that you put this up somewhere and forget about it for six months. And it basically records the sun over a period of six months. So you want to put it somewhere where it's not going to get blown away or washed away. But if you do that and you leave it for six months, at the end of that six months, you open it up and you can develop the photographic paper and you get some pretty amazing things. And this is a solar gram uh, 
by Alexandra Hart, which I thought was really, really impressive. What, what you're seeing here is the sun moving across the sky, rising in the middle of the summer, getting very, very high up in the middle of the winter, very much lower down. And you can see where it's cloudy and where there have been cloud breaks, but um, an amazing project. I think I, I looked online and you can buy these cans for about 15 pounds, something like that. Buy one, stick it up, leave it for six months, come back and you get a, a really good record of what's happened um, to the sun over over a, a six month period. Uh, there was another of these by Matt Williams. Uh, this one uh, is interesting in that you can actually see some of the foreground that's recorded on this uh, very, very insensitive camera as well. Um, so it's a really good demonstration of the fact that the Earth has an actual tilt of 23 and a half degrees, uh, which is what causes the sun to be high up in, in the summer and low down in the winter. It's remarkable how many people seem to think that in the summer that somehow summer is caused by us being closer to the sun and being further away in the winter. And you point out to them, well, how does that make Australia, Australia's seasons work? But, but obviously it's not. It's because of our axial tilt. And this records it really well. So um, these are becoming more and more popular. Um, and I certainly recommend you have a go. I've, I've actually bought one and I'm going to set one up on top of my garage and see what, uh, see what I get over the next six months. All of that solar activity has led to some really spectacular auroral displays for those people who are lucky enough to live far enough north to actually see them. And our deep sky section director, who, who used to live in Gloucestershire, uh, has moved up to the Orkneys and has been getting a fantastic view of the auroral display. So this was uh, one of the displays that happened this month. I think this is the 15th, 13th, is it? 13th. Um, really impressive display uh, from uh, Orkney and Callum has actually sent me a video as well so that's a still frame so that's a fairly long exposure I think it's a few seconds with a Sony Alpha camera and when you see these things if you haven't seen an Aurora you don't really get the impression of how dynamic they are you know you, you see this static picture here but in fact aurorae can be really dynamic they can ripple across the sky in a matter of a few seconds and so what this is is actually a in real time it's it's a fairly slow frame rate it's about five frames a second i think but it's real time video of an aurora taken with a sony a7 camera and a 20 millimeter i think f2 lens and you can see you can see how it develops. You can see how these beams sort of suddenly develop and shoot up. And, and that's the amazing thing when you actually see an aurora in real life, is just how rapidly they can change their shape. Um, so anyway, anyway, Callum is really well set up up there in Orkney with his, his cameras. Uh, but also we have uh, Dennis Bozinski, who is up that way as well, um, in Tarbot Ness. So Tarbot Ness is sort of between Inverness and Wick, so it's a bit further south than Orkney, but uh, it still gets very good aurora. And Dennis asked me to set up a camera for him. So we've set up this camera, which is on the north facing side of a garden shed that he's got. Uh, and that camera monitors the sky permanently. So Dennis can basically check to see whether there's, there's any aurora without the tiresome thing of actually going to have to go outside and check every now and again. And when he sees, when he sees that there is an aurora, he can actually set up his camera. But this, uh, this camera has been really uh, useful for that. And uh, one of the things it does is it produces a time lapse. Hmm? Oh. Ah. Oh. Uh, hang on a sec. I said to turn the lights down, but I can't see where the buttons are. That's all right. <laughs> so it produces a time lapse through the night, uh, and this is an example of, of what you get. So this is a, starts off as a rather cloudy night. There's a road here uh, to the north of Dennis's that runs down to the local lighthouse. Um, so uh, Peter will know this. We actually had to put up a shield to blank out the lighthouse. Um, but you can see here, this is the aurora developing through the night. Every now and again, a car drives along this road. Um, and so this is running continually. And Dennis is then able to, um, if he sees an aurora, he's then able to go outside 
and actually take a picture. And if he does that, that's the wrong one. I'll get there in a minute. If he does that, uh, that's what he gets. So you can see there's a, a really significant um, difference between the video camera, which is going at 25 frames a second, and what you can get if you do a long exposure. But the video camera gives him a permanent record of what's happening and also warns him to go outside. And it's quite nice. I can remote into it as well, so I can watch it too, and I can send him an email saying, Dennis, there's an aurora going on outside the window. Go out and, go out and take some pictures. Do you have any idea what the exposure was? Uh, what, of the, the video? Um, uh, this, I think it's a few seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So this is quite a long exposure, so this will have smeared out some of that detail, but it shows you uh, how sensitive uh, a camera is with a long exposure. It's a fast lens as well. So moving on to the planets, we, we've just had the talk about Venus, and of course Venus is now coming into the evening sky. It's very, very low still, but this is a really lovely picture that David sent me at 3 a.m. this morning, I think it was, David, um, of, of Venus low, low in the west. And uh, if you do have a clear western horizon and you've got a clear night, it's pretty obvious. It's still, it's a very, very bright planet. And... Um, Paul has even managed to draw it at an altitude of how, how high up was it when yeah, you made this drawing? Just above the rooftop, so <laughs> I had 40 minutes to do it. So I can imagine, I can imagine the singing was impressive. I but, always uh, is for Venus. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, it wasn't too bad, actually, because it was the early evening and it was, this, it was fairly steady. So, so Venus is at a, a fairly southerly declination at the moment, but it will come north, and so that's why it eventually it, it will, over the spring, become much higher in our skies and, and much easier to observe. There's um, a conjunction, which is actually on our website as a challenge between uh, Saturn and Venus on the 22nd. So if you have a clear western sky, um, get out and see if you can take some photographs or observe that. Venus will be very prominent, Saturn is much fainter, so it will be much more difficult to see. As far as the other planets are concerned, Mars has been around for a long time. It's now disappearing over to the west, but people are still getting good, good images of it. This one by Peter Tickner, uh, taken on the 16th of January, showing quite a bit of detail on the surface. Jupiter, of course, <laughs> is um, it's pretty much past its best now, but um, Damien Peach uh, and Ian Sharp were in, was it Barbados? Is it that where they go for there? So they'd, got, they'd gone to Barbados and collected terabytes of data whilst they were out there and have just got around to analysing some of it. And this is something that Damien found in some data from last summer. So is it, is it, no, it's October, is it, I think? Yeah. Um, showing a bright spot on Io. So this spot here, there. Um, now I spoke to John Rogers, director of the Jupiter section, and it does look like this is real. Um, what it is, we don't quite know yet. We don't have any spacecraft coverage of it, but it's in a region, is it Acala Fluctus? That's right, yes. Gosh, I'm amazed I remembered that from your... <laughs> which, is, which is, uh, because Io is a volcanic world, rather different to the kind of volcanoes that we have on the Earth, um, but uh, it's in a volcanic region, and it's possible that what Damien has imaged is the result of a volcanic eruption on Io. Um, so that's pretty impressive. We're talking about detecting volcanoes on Venus. Uh, this is detecting volcanoes on Io. And bear in mind that this, uh, this was 1.27 arc seconds in diameter when they took this image. So pretty amazing resolution. Um, yeah, this is John's uh, compilation of, of um, the image and, and where it is. So this, this, uh, this uh, area of Carla Fluctus here is a kind of brighter area on Io, and it seems to line up with uh, where, where Damien's bright spot was. So if that turns out to be a new feature, that will be pretty amazing, I think, for an amateur observer to have discovered something that on the moon of Jupiter. 
Um, talking of other small planets, uh, Uranus has been around, but again is, is disappearing. Uh, this one from Luigi Moroni shows some, possibly some sort of uh, albedo features in the clouds of Uranus, uh, but not, not the most exciting of worlds. So, I'll move on to my specialist subject, which is the comet that's around at the moment. And you may well have seen in the media, and I've had lots of people say to me, have you seen the green comet streaking across the, the sky yet? Well, yes, I have seen a very faint fuzz in my binoculars. And if streaking across the sky means it moves about the diameter of the moon in five hours, uh, then that really is streaking across the sky. But, but here we are, it is a comet. It's grandly known as 2022 E3ZTF because Comets are all discovered by survey telescopes now, so they don't get named after people, which is a real shame. ZTF is the Zwicky Transient Facility. Zwicky was an interesting character, but that's a different story. But the, um, they're, they're looking for transients, so um, all sorts of things that move or outburst in the sky. They discovered this comet, and for us, it's extremely well placed. So it's just gone past perihelion, its closest point to the sun. It's approaching the Earth, and it will be at its closest to the Earth at the end of January, so February the 1st. And because of its orbit, it's actually going uh, very high in the sky for us. Most, most of the time, comets we see are low in the sky, difficult to get. This one is high up. So it actually passes. It's, it's down here at the moment, uh, just, just here. It's going to pass very close to Polaris. So this is Ursa Minor. This is the plough here. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, I mean, I found it in binoculars from my back garden in Chelmsford. It's, it's pretty well defined. It's quite a nice, reasonably bright fuzzball. Um, and it's been a very odd comet in that it's been incredibly well behaved. Most of the time with comets, we never really quite know what they're gonna do. This one has been very, very well behaved. Um, its orbit, the reason that we get such a good view of it is its orbit is essentially starting up in the uh, high north. It's diving down. We're just about to cross its orbit plane um, in the next couple of days. So we will see, see what effect that has. But it's been north of the, the ecliptic, which means it gives, gives us a very, very good view. Uh, Paul did a visual observation of it. Uh, was this yesterday? Uh, two days ago. Uh, when he estimated it to be about magnitude 6.2, uh, it's, it's probably somewhere around 5.8, 5.9 now. Um, now that's, in cometry terms, a comet that's 5.8 or 5.9 is not like a star that, that you could see fairly easily. It's, uh, it's quite diffuse. And so this may be naked eye, possibly naked eye from a dark site, uh, but it's certainly a relatively easy binocular object. The light curve, as you can see, is incredibly well behaved all the way from when it was, oops, all the way from when it was discovered to, uh, to now. It's, uh, it's behaving pretty much as we expected. And we expect it will probably reach about fifth magnitude um, at the end of this month. So you've got, got a couple of weeks to see it now. Uh, the moon will start to becoming, becoming a nuisance in the evening sky uh, in, a, in, a, in a few days or so. It will then, but it's still best in the morning sky. So one of the reasons I'm, I'm looking a bit more haggard than normal is that I've been up at three o'clock in the morning every morning for the last five days to, to take images of this comet. So it's certainly not like this one. This is the one that we saw two years ago. This is Neowise 2020F3. But it illustrates quite nicely the two different tails that comets have. So you have a, a dust tail, which is essentially a whitish yellow tail because it shines by reflecting sunlight. And you have an ion tail, which is a bluish tail because it's shining by emission mainly from carbon monoxide ions. So gas goes into the coma, gets blown back by the solar wind. Uh, the solar wind, um, and then this gas then fluoresces, and it gives you that nice blue color. But just a warning, if you're going to take, try and take some pictures of this comet, um, and you're in a slightly light-polluted place, you might be tempted to use a light-pollution rejection filter. 
And one of the most popular light pollution rejection filters effectively completely would suppress that 400 and, uh, 425 nanometer blue light from the ion tail. So if you are going to take pictures of this comet, don't use a light pollution rejection filter, or if you do use one, check to see what its cutoff is, because otherwise you won't see the ion tail at all. It's been growing rapidly. Uh, this is an image by David Swan from about, um, what, 12, 13 days ago, when it was dominated by uh, dust. But you can see that small ion tail just coming out of the top. This is uh, a nice picture from Dennis Pazinski up in Tarbet Ness using a Takahashi astrograph. Um, and you've got the, the colors here. So you've got the uh, ion tail, you've got the green coma, and you've got the yellowish, whitish dust here. Now, the ion tail has been the kind of big thing that everybody's been talking about with this comet because it's been growing and growing. And it's, um, it changes from not just night to night, but from hour to hour and even minute to minute. So this is a picture I took of it on the 17th, uh, and it shows uh, a rather nice bit of structure and a split in the tail. Uh, this is Mazin Yunus's picture that he took from his remote telescope in Morocco, showing the same thing. Uh, you've got green comb in there and a very impressive straight ion tail. Uh, this uh, was taken by Peter Carson um, from Pagelsham on the Essex coast with a 100 millimeter f2 lens. So you can actually get quite impressive images of this comet, uh, even using a, just a DSLR and a, a camera lens. If, you've got, if you can find a reasonably dark site, you can trace the ion tail pretty much out of the frame here. And right around the, the center here, you've got the, the dust from the comet, which we're seeing almost in uh, profile now behind the comet. So this is why this is widening up to quite a big fan. Um, anyone who's been up to see the comet over the last uh, few days will realize it's been blooming cold in the morning. And uh, Peter says that he was out at Pagelsham in his car and everything froze up and he couldn't actually open the doors, the tailgate of his car to get back in. Um, luckily, he could get the driver door open and he had to pull all of his equipment back into the car through the driver's door. So, so you might think that that's a bit of a problem, you know, uh, cold weather. But it's nothing compared to this. This is where Dan Bartlett takes his comet images from. It's June Lake in California, high in the mountains. They've had a lot of snow there. Uh, Dan uses a Celestron 11, Rasa, Roa, and Schmidt, and had to dig a big hole to, uh, to get this working. So that's pretty good dedication for you, I think. And I think, Peter, your moan about the tailgate in your car freezing <laughs> is nothing. It would have been a long walk home, though. It would have been a long walk home, but uh, at least you haven't got six foot of snow to walk through. Uh, but Dan's pictures are just stunning. Um, he has a really dark sky. He's up in a mountain, so he just gets absolutely amazing pictures of the comet. Um, other people have been submitting pictures. This is so Peter Tickner, who does a lot of planetary stuff, has also been imaging the comet, which is, which is great. And uh, Mark Charon here uh, took this image a few days ago using a Samyang 135mm f2 lens, which is a really good lens, actually. It's a, it's a very kind of economical, fast, medium-focus lens. And that shows the, the dust... Um, fan and the ion tail really nicely. But the ion tail is a very fickle thing because it depends on what the solar wind is doing. And because the sun's been so active recently, what happened a few days ago was what's called a disconnection event. So essentially what happens here is that the ion tail, which is driven by the, the solar wind and the interplanetary magnetic field, um, because of something the sun did a little while before, uh, the magnetic field uh, reverses at the comet, and it effectively rips the ion tail off the comet. So this is what was the ion tail, and you can see it moving back here over a period of about an hour, and the comet's generate, generating a new highly collimated tail um, before it. So, so essentially, the, the, if people take long exposures of the comet, all of this gets smeared out. 
So one of the things about uh, taking pictures of comets, if you want to pick up detail in the ion tail, is you need to keep the exposure short because, because of this, this activity. But essentially what's happened to the comet now is that the ion tail has been completely disrupted by this disconnection event. And this is what, um, what it looked like this morning. Um, so you've got this huge area of dust, which is the dust tail, and the ion tail has, has kind of disappeared into a chaotic little fan here. Um, you also have dust coming out the front as well, because we're, we're, going to, we're just about to cross the uh, orbit plane of the comet. Um, so it looks very, very different now. Um, but other people were out this morning too. Uh, just got a couple more pictures uh, to show you of the comet before we, we, we finish. This, um, this was posted to the VAA website during this meeting um, by Hugh Allen. It's a spectrum of the comet that he took this morning. Um, and most of what we can see when we look at a comet is, is what's called swan band emission, which is this carbon emission, this, which is greenish in colour. But there's a huge emission from cyanogen which is in the, the violet. Um, too short a wavelength, really, for us to see. Um, but the comet is, is really active in that. So really good to see spectra, again, of this comet. And the ability of amateurs to take spectra as spectrograms of comets has improved a lot over the last few years. And this isn't a particularly bright comet, but getting really good quality spectra is great. And then this, which I think is an absolutely fantastic image, by David Strange taken this morning using one of these little red cap 51s, which is a, a sort of photographic telescope. Um, and uh, it shows a lot of features here. So you've got the green coma, you've got this huge dust fan, which if you imagine what this is, this is the tail of the comet, the dust tail of the comet projected back into the screen. So we're looking almost along its orbital plane. And then you have this little vestigial ion tail here. So who knows what's going to happen to this comet over the next couple of weeks. We can predict accurately where it's going to be. We can predict probably pretty accurately how bright it's going to be. We really don't know how the tails are going to develop and what it's going to look like. So do take the opportunity to get out and have a look at it because it, even though it's not a bright green comet streaking across the sky, it's, it's a pretty nice comet. It's, um, it's kind of binocular object. Um, Naked eye, possibly in a really dark site. At the moment, it's, it's best seen in the morning sky. Um, and it probably will remain best seen in the morning sky simply because the moon is coming into the evening sky now. But you don't need to be getting up at 3 a.m. to see it. You can actually see it to the midnight. It's beginning to, to rise. And as it gets closer to the pole, um, it'll be easier and easier to observe all the way through the night. Just a couple more. Comet ones, and then we'll be on to the final leg of this. So, uh, this is a uh, comet. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten more than ten minutes. It'll be five. Um, Twenty-nine. This is twenty-nine P uh, schwarzman bachmann which is a comet which is very different to um, ZTF. It's a comet which is in an orbit similar to Jupiter's orbit. Um, it's a, a big comet with a nucleus maybe sixty kilometers across. It keeps going into an outburst. And Richard Miles runs a program for the comet section uh, looking at it. And we've had a, a very large number of outbursts recently of this comet. So lots and lots of interesting stuff to do in the comet world. <laughs> so in my last five minutes or so, just variable stars. There's a few variable stars that are, are worth you looking at. <clears throat> this one, GK Persei, was a nova that went off in 1901. It got to magnitude 0.2. Uh, when it was a nova, but it now seems to have turned in from, a, from a normal nova into a recurrent nova. And you can see every now and again, it brightens up. And the most re recent brightening has, has just happened. And Mike Harlow, taken an image of it there between the, the bars. And he's also used his objective prism, which is just a glass prism in front of the telescope, to take a spectrum of it. So you can see here, unlike the spectra that people do uh, with, with the spectrograms that, that um, produce things like Q Allen's uh, spectra, this actually produces an image of the spectrum of every object in the field. And you can see here GK per, and you can see various lines in it. So this, this uh, objective prism approach used to be something the professionals used a lot. They don't now, but it's a really interesting approach for, for amateurs to use. 
And this is actually an objective prism, which I think was part of the BAA instrument collection originally. Um, another one that's worth looking at is this. It's what's called a blazer. It's, um, it's actually a, a, a galaxy, an active galactic nucleus, which has gone into outburst. And it's, it's the brightest it's ever been. It's about 12th magnitude. And it's an extremely long way away, because essentially what we're seeing is the collimated light from, from one of these quasars. So uh, that one's worth uh, finding. It's, uh, it's in Pisces, so uh, it's kind of uh, reasonably accessible. And then the final one, I mentioned it last time at Christmas, RW CFI, which is a sort of similar thing to Betelgeuse, uh, in that this star... Uh, fluctuates about a bit, but it's gone into quite a, a big fade now. And it's a naked eye, uh, sorry, it's a binocular object. It's something that you can actually estimate quite well with binoculars. Um, definitely worth, uh, if you're out with binoculars, having a look and seeing if you can make a magnitude estimate of this one. And then finally, David, I just wanted to mention this. Lots of you will have seen this, hopefully, on the BBC website. A really, really good write-up about light pollution. Um, I've had lots of people mention this to me in the last couple of days, and it's really good from the point of view of just people's recognition of the fact that light pollution is a real problem, not just to us, not just to astronomers worried about seeing things in the night sky, but to all sorts of things, to people's health, to the health of wildlife. Uh, there's a really good set of links on that BBC page that take you to various things. This I thought was really good. It's from the Royal Horticultural Society and it was on a page about lighting up your gardens. So, you know, people seem to like their lighting up trees and lighting up their gardens so it looks pretty, but it has a horrible effect on wildlife, uh, insects in particular. And the security lights as well. Really. Security lights are just the worst. Absolutely. Worst of the worst. It my observing. Yeah, it, it does for a lot of people and uh, security lights they're not really security lights because, I mean, I've got a neighbour who's got one that comes on if a, if a fly flies past and it stays on for five minutes. Yes, that's silly. Uh, and another thing I was looking at, I don't normally read the comments on the BBC website, but I thought I'd read this one. And 95% of the comments were all about, yeah, this is terrible, it's a terrible waste of energy, it's a terrible impact on our environment. There was one that particularly caught my eye, though, because it's very characteristic of what's happening around where I live. And it's this one. It says, it isn't helped by the growing trend for people to floodlight their suburban homes, drives, doorways, gateposts, cars and gardens, as if they're some kind of national monument. <laughs> it's utterly bizarre, naff and unnecessary. And it is. I, I have houses around me that are just kind of normal houses where they've actually lit up the front of the house as if it's a church or a castle or something. I just cannot understand it. Have you challenged them <laughs> Knock on the door. Any, anyhow, it's it, it's a really good article, and I think it does show that there is a lot of public traction for this. If only we can actually just get people to to, to sort of take that seriously, because it affects so many things. Anyway, thank you, thank you, everybody. David, hopefully that was done in time, and um, hope you enjoyed the meeting. Yeah.